Hello YouTube, Michael here. Today I'm here with Jesse to talk about developmental interpretability and interpreting God's programming language. So I'm sorry, I'm Michael Trazzi and you're in an Inside View. And today is day four of the vlog and we're at Alas Alamos Park in San Francisco. It is currently very windy and we're very cold. So we're trying to be quick here. Uh, so here's actually Jesse Hookland. So what is interpretability and why are you interested in it? I'm, oh my God, I'm doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, you keep having to tell me not to touch the microphone. Anyway, interpretability is about understanding what's going on inside of neural networks. Why do we care to understand what's going on inside of neural networks? Well, because they might want to kill us. And if we can understand what's going on inside of them, we might be able to stop that. I, I don't understand. I, I'm, I'm like a simple like AI user. I use ChatGPT every day. And he, he never tries to kill me. He's just like being very nice to me and being very useful. And I, I heard it like you can just like give him like instructions. You can just like tell him like if it's good or bad. And, and at the end, he just like learns how to like be very useful to humans. So if we just like scale those models up and like tell them to be useful to humans and like, why would they want to kill us? Why would they like behave differently from the like fine tuning data? So maybe, maybe we just keep making these systems bigger and they just end up being friendly and caring about us. On the other hand, what about humans? Right, humans, you make them bigger and smarter and faster. And do we care more about chimpanzees now? Do we care more about? I, I think, I think, I think, I think we, there's like more and more people we care about the animal suffering, less and less people eating meat. I think, I think some people will say that like being more ethical is like some like sort of convergence in, in, in like human moral or something. And because people tend to be like more altruistic uh, as, they, as they like grow older or like learn more things about the world. I think the important reason to be concerned about future AI systems, even if current AI systems seem reasonable, is that power decreases the margin for error, right? The more, more power you in inject into a system, the more capable they become. It turns out if, you know, if they're only slightly misaligned with us, slightly different to us in values, that can have big consequences. And so we have to be very careful when we get to very large, powerful systems. Yeah, it, if, I'm, if I'm someone who believes that like, technology will mostly be like, good for humanity, I would think that like, why, why would we want like, AIs to be aligned with our values? Like, wh why can I just like, have AI have their own values and like maybe like human values are like so hard to understand, right? So why can't we just like have a very good ChatGPT, like a very useful tool that helps humans and have different values, but it's just going to be like useful. So <laughs> I see you want me to give the entire <laughs> AI extra skin intro. Let's start at the beginning. <laughs> no, 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 don't need to be in the beginning. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just like when I hear someone say we need to align our AIs to our values. And otherwise, if they're like slightly misaligned, that they're very dangerous. I can see a lot of people watching this and being like, no, um, why, why do we need to have it understand human values? Why do we, uh, why does it like start wanting to kill us? And it, I think those, those like questions are valid in some sense. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's valid too. I don't think it's obvious. I, I'm not one of those total doomers who think there's a 99% chance of doom. So what's their actual, My actual what's the actual probability? On a good day, like a, like coin flip odds, maybe 60% odds of doom. And on, on a bad day? 80% plus. No. Yeah. How, how, do you, how do you wake up in the morning and, and get out of bed knowing that there's possibly like an 80% chance of, of every single human you've ever like met dying? I'm just your average guy and I'm unconscious most of the day while I'm working, grinding away. Yeah, so you work unconscious? <laughs> I mean, just like anybody else, really. <laughs> um, no, it, but in, in reality, I think uh, it's gone a lot easier since since I actually started working on AI safety. Um, when 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 was that? Really, about a year ago that I decided to do this full time. What was the like turning point? So I was working on a health tech startup. I had started a company. Um, we were doing we were automating bariatric surgery patient journeys. At some point, I realized that I did not care about it at all. You didn't care about like the health of other fellow humans. <laughs> That's a, that was a charitable interpretation. <laughs> let let me rephrase it. I did not care about the kinds of problems that I was dealing with. You know, the kind of 
the stupid software engineering, the sort of mindless web development that was going into it. Um, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't cut out for me. And yeah, so that combined with the fact that I'd been growing ever more concerned at some point led to a tipping point and I knew I had to do something. So you, you already knew about AI alignment or AI safety at the time. Like how did you, when was the first time you heard about it? Yeah, uh, many years ago, uh, back in 2015, when I wrote Superintelligence by Nick Bostrom. And at the time, I just thought, oh, this is very far off in the future. Not not immediately relevant in my lifetime, but... So you thought, like, oh, this is someone else's problem, not mine. Someone else's problem, or maybe I can't contribute much to this yet. Or maybe I saw that a lot of the kinds of problems people were thinking about were not problems I was familiar with. And uh, I heard you were somehow a physicist before, like you studied physics. Mm -hmm. So... This is most likely your background is like you learn about physics and then you like work for this like biotech company and then you start doing AI. Is it correct or is there other other lives, other stories? Those are the main ones and the rest I'm going to leave a mystery. <laughs> but now I'm curious about like the present moment. Um, what are you currently like interested in? And uh, yeah, what do you say like a promising path towards like helping out with alignment? Yeah, so I think I think there are many things we should be doing. And I'm excited about many things, but for myself, I'm most excited about bringing ideas from physics into, into making sense of what's going on inside of neural networks. And so that's where this singular learning theory comes from. You can see it as a kind of application of thermodynamics to neural networks. What's, what's singular learning theory? I think, yeah, you, you're, you're, you're saying this as, as, as if I knew everything about it, but... I think the best way to think about singular learning theory is that it's something like the thermodynamics of learning or maybe the, the statistical physics of learning. So it takes a bunch of ideas that we understand pretty well from physics and applies them to neural networks to making sense of them. It's a relatively new field. It's like two decades old, all invented by this one brilliant guy in, in Japan, Sumio Watanabe, who just saw the ingredients and clicked them into place and started to apply them to neural networks and other systems like them. So that's why it's like a few years ago, or it's still going on? Was the, when, 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 did, when, when did, he do, did he do that? Yeah, so this was uh, more than a decade ago that he saw the ingredients that would lead to singular learning theory. It's actually a very general theory that applies to many other systems. Um, but only recently have people sort of started to see that it could be relevant for alignment. And so were you one of those people? Or like, is, was there someone else who like, saw the link between this and alignment? So I was first introduced to this subject by Alexander Hitling Oldenziel. <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very long name. It is a very long name. We were going back from some conference and I asked him, so Alex, what do you think are the two or three most important research directions within AI safety? After, you know, thinking about it for a second, he looks at me and sort of, fine, you're not going to be interested in this anyway, <laughs> but you know, it's singular learning theory. <laughs> and then this one other thing, computational mechanics, epsilon machines. Um, and you know, the way he phrased it, as if I wasn't going to be interested in it. Well, obviously that that sparked that sparked the interest. So, so, so you took this as a challenge, and so you spent like a week trying to learn it. Yeah, right. So, so he he sent me this thesis, and like I I tried to read it, and you know I I recognized some of the words, but it was just, what the hell is going on here, man? And after a second pass and a third pass, some things were starting to make sense. It really it fit into, you know, the things I'd learned during during my physics masters. Yeah, so if I'm like a random YouTube subscriber watching this video right now, I kind of like have the sense that it's something linked to like thermodynamics or like physics and something with neural networks. But like if you had like a machine learning engineer in front of you, someone who knows neural networks, how would you explain it like simply or uh, like the intuition behind it? So when we are training a neural network, there's this idea of a loss landscape, right? And you're trying to move down this loss landscape to find better solutions. So what singular learning theory tells us is that it's, it's a few points in this landscape that determine the overall learning behavior. And that's a similar insight to the one we've had in physics, where it's the geometry of the energy landscape that decides many of the physical properties we're interested in. So SLT tells us that by understanding the local geometry around these critical points, so think of places that are, um, you know, flat, so equilibria, stable or unstable and similar points like that, they decide the overall learning behavior. Because there's like some convergence towards like local optimal kind of things or? Well, 
I don't want to, that's one way to think about it. So in very, situ very simple situations, you can imagine you have like a ball and you want, you have a, a, a ball running around this ball and it's just going to eventually settle to the, to the bottom because there's th friction and so it's dissipating heat and it's losing energy and it s settles at the bottom. Um, and so in general, points like that, like this minimum, yeah, they determine the qualitative shape of that, of that landscape. But really the, the other important thing that we observe from these singularities, hence the name singular learning theory, is that they are somehow simpler than other points in this landscape. And so when you're, when you're learning, you want to come up with the, the simplest possible explanation for the data, right? This is Occam's razor. And what SLT tells us is that the singularities are somehow simpler. And so by finding them, you can generalize better. And so it explains part of the reason that, that neural networks work at all. What's an example of like a singularity inside the lost landscape? What's an example? Yeah, so, so think of, you know, the classic example is like, if, if people try to think about what the bottom of the lost landscape looks like, a lot of them will imagine something that looks kind of like a, like a bull. You know, it's a, a, a round but it's not paraboloid. A it's like something that like falls very quickly? Or? It's not a bull. There are valleys, right? So there are usually directions you can walk along that don't change the loss. And it's not just a valley, it's like a canyon structure. So there are intersections between valleys. And those kinds of points are the, the singularities that really matter. So these intersection points, they're more complicated structures like that. What, what happens between two valleys is like... What happens between two valleys? Well, if you have two valleys, maybe another way that machine learning researchers talk about this is they talk about different basins. Uh, different basins seem to correspond to different computational structures, different ways of implementing a function or implementing some algorithm. So if they're qualitatively different algorithms, they're different solutions, well, that's very relevant for us, right? We want to understand, like, what is this neural network actually doing? Is it lying to me? Is it being deceptive? Um, those kinds of questions start to get at, at this, this question of how is it actually generalizing? How is it actually performing computations internally? Um, I'm, I'm going to ask a very like bullish, uh, sorry, a very like blunt question. Um, do we actually understand anything new using singular learning theory? Like, do, do, do we can, can we actually like, predict things that we weren't predicting before? Yeah, so I, I think the most interesting predictions made by SLT are phase transitions. It tells us that we should expect there to be phase transitions, so discrete changes, sudden changes in the kinds of computations being performed by a model um, over the course of training. And so I should give that a little caveat, right? So a lot of this theory is, is built in, an, in another learning paradigm, Bayesian learning. And so there's still some work to apply this to the learning paradigm we have in the case of neural networks, mm -hmm. which is with stochastic gradient descent, right? It's this, this ball running down, running down the hill. So what it does tell us is it predicts these phase transitions um, and that, that would tell us something very significant about what makes neural networks different from other kinds of models. And what are the very different things that he predicts? Right, so, so we have lots of evidence for things like phase transitions in, in neural networks. Um, when people talk about phase transitions in machine learning, a lot of it's kind of hand wavy, right? They're saying like, oh, there's a certain sudden drop in the loss or a sudden drop in some other metric. It's like, questionable and you know they kind of want to borrow the physics language because it sounds nice um the thing is they're probably right these are probably actually phase transitions in the physical sense of the word phase transition now like for 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 things like grokking or like grokking another example would be this induction heads paper uh where they find that at a certain point in training there's this bump where models suddenly learn how to do induction they suddenly learn how to if a is followed by B earlier in a text to then predict B if you see A again later in a text. Um, and so there are a bunch of phenomena like these that still need to be really linked to the picture from SLT. But if it's the case that these are phase transitions as predicted by theory, uh, that'd be a, a major plus point, a major selling point for SLT. And why do we really care about these phase transitions, right? Well, first of all, they seem to represent the discrete changes in computation. And that's, that's concerning for, for a safety perspective. You know, a lot of these scenarios we think about when we think about why could AI be dangerous, a lot of these threat models run through some kind of discrete sudden change. 
thinking of like, you know, maybe the model suddenly learns how to be deceptive uh, and it's able to lie now. And if it's sudden, it gives us little time to react. Uh, so we, we want to be able to anticipate these moments, understand what's going on in them. Right? When we're thinking about the ways in which AI could be dangerous, we think about these threat models. A lot of these threat models run through a scenario in which a model goes through some sudden change. Maybe it suddenly, it suddenly develops a dangerous capability. It suddenly acquires a value that isn't aligned with us. I think, I think people don't really know what a threat model is, except from people on this run. Right, so a threat model is like a, like a, a concrete scenario you describe uh, of one way that AI or some other risk might result in damage to, to people or extinction or whatever you want. So yeah, when, when you do like alignment research to try to prevent or, or circumvent those threat models by making your AI more aligned in, the, in, in this particular threat model, right? Right, so, so I think, you know, one of the reasons we're interested in interpretability is because if we can read the internals of the brain of these, these systems, we might be able to read things like deception and then prevent deception. And that seems very relevant. But we want to be able to, to detect deception as it forms. We want to be able to know when these dangerous capabilities are first acquired because it might be too late. They might become, you know, sort of stuck and crystallized and hard to get rid of. And so we want to do, we want to understand how dangerous capabilities, how misaligned values develop over the course of training. So phase transitions seem particularly relevant for that because they represent kind of the, the most important structural changes, the qualitative changes in the shape of, of these models and terminals. Now, beyond that, another reason we're interested in phase transitions is that phase transitions in physics are understood to be a kind of point of contact between the microscopic world and the macroscopic world. So it's a point where you have more control over the behavior of a system than you, than you normally do. That seems relevant to us from a, from a safety engineering perspective. Wait, why do you have more control in a physical system during phase transitions? So, so phase transitions, um, so this is going to get a little technical, so I don't want to... <laughs> They're like, yeah, you, you can go more in like, in just like a concrete example, like um, if you're driving a car, like a, a very simple thing, like... Um, so let me give you an example, right? So take a magnet, right? If you heat a magnet to a high enough temperature, then it's no longer a magnet. It no longer has an overall magnetization, right? And so if you bring another magnet to it, they won't stick. But if you cool it down, at some point it reaches this Curie temperature. If you push it lower, then it will become magnetized. So the entire thing will all of a sudden get a direction. It'll have a North Pole and a South Pole. So the thing is though, like, which direction will that North Pole or South Pole be? And so it turns out that you only need an infinitesimally small perturbation to that system in order to point it in a, in a certain direction. And so that's the kind of sensitivity you see where the microscopic structure becomes very sensitive to tiny external perturbations. And so if we, if we bring this back to neural networks, um, if the weights are like slightly different, the overall model could be like deceptive or not. Is it like something similar or? This is, this is speculative. Mm -hmm. There are more concrete examples. So there are these toy models of uh, superposition studied by Anthropic. And that's a case where you can see that it's learning some embedding and unembedding, so it's trying to compress data. You can see that the way it compresses data involves this kind of symmetry breaking, the sensitivity, where it selects one solution um, out of phase transition. So I hear what you're saying about physics. It sounds very interesting, and I'm glad that you're doing this research because your background in physics. Uh, but I think most people don't know about interpretability. Uh, I think it's like common in ML, but for people like layman person on YouTube, like, why do we care about making models interpretable? And is there like any way, um, yeah, what are the things people like actually do for making models like interpretable? Like, what, what does it mean? There are several stories you can tell about interpretability. Maybe the easiest one is something like, we can detect when it's lying to us. What are they thinking? You know, can we read their minds? And if that works, that'd be great because we can detect things like deception, maybe. You know, we want to know when it's lying to us because that could be uh, when the model's hiding that it wants to do harmful things to us. So that's what interpretability is trying to do. And traditionally, there's this, this field of mechanistic interpretability, which is trying to reverse engineer what's going on inside of neural networks. You know, ideally, you could like write down a program 
in a programming language after you've done mechanistic interpretability and all of a sudden have a very interpretable, have something you can just read and understand what's going on inside these networks. And I, I was looking at my comments yesterday and uh, one guy was commenting like, if someone is very, very smart, uh, it will just like try to hide as much as it can until like it, it finds the right opportunity. Like, why are you bullish on us being able to detect like a very smart agent lying to us? Well, the, the first reason to be somewhat optimistic is the fact that we have the weights. We have these models on our computers, right? So neuroscience, we can't read people's minds yet. But there's an, another problem with neuroscience, which is we don't even know how to measure things going on in your brain, right? or at least how to measure them accurately. And so at least with neural networks, we have all of that information available to us. So that's one, one strong thing for interpretability. What, what if it's like learning online and is like being trained, like how would you detect something that is like being trained and the ways are changing? So, <laughs> so maybe get to that in a second. <laughs> I just want to add one more reason, which is one more reason that you should think something like interpretability might, might, might be possible. Um, and that's this claim, this hypothesis of universality, right? So if you train vision models, so models that are trying to predict, you know, is this a cat or a dog or trying to draw a box around some image, what you find is that many different models, many different architectures develop very similar internal representations. So they have very similar circuits that look for edges and then certain combinations of edges to form circles or maybe they look for a region with a high frequency and a region with a low frequency, which represents an edge. Uh, and these kinds of structures are, are universal across many different models. So the universality hypothesis says that many different models, maybe trained on many different kinds of data, many different architectures, converge to similar internal structures and similar ways of reasoning about the world. So the, the, the same structure that you have in uh, like Chris Ola's blog post on circuits uh, for vision networks, like every every vision network would like have the same circuits at the end of the, so are there like theorems or like conversions proofs on this or is this like mostly like intuition right now? So right now, this stuff is very empirical um, and there's some more evidence, right? So if you look at the way that humans process images, it's also very similar to the way these models do it. You have these, this whole, these, these Gabor filters, right? So the curved what, detector. What, what filters? Gabor filters is a name, like, these are filters that were um, developed long before we had neural networks. And then it turns out that these neural networks develop very similar kinds of filters to the ones we know that humans are Im implementing uh, to the ones we, we used to already implement. So, yeah, so th that's an example of this. Um, so, so we know that, like, um, th those kind of filters... Is, is like a point of convergence, like the those kind of filters end up like happening inside neural networks. Those um, are like emerge from most like training process. Right. So so this this stuff is empirical, but there are theoretical reasons to think something like universality might be possible. And so again, this appeals to the to the physical picture, where in physics you have a different notion of universality. So it turns out that many different systems. You take magnets. You take certain fluids and you study them close to phase transitions, it turns out that they behave qualitatively very similar. So they have these scaling exponents. It turns out that their behavior close to these points is identical, independent, uh, totally independent of the microscopic details of the structure. So if we expect something similar to hold for neural networks, then, then maybe we can make connections there. Maybe this universality also applies in the case of learning machines. In any case, that's what interpretability, mechanistic interpretability, help to do. Now, the problem is obviously with very large systems, how do you figure out all of the things that are going on inside of a neural network? Maybe you can find many of the, the big picture things, but it's very hard to find all of the little details. So that's, that's a struggle with, with interpretability. Developmental interpretability proposes that we study how structure forms over the course of training. And it thinks, you know, I think maybe it's more tractable to find out what's going on in the neural network at the end if we just understand each individual transition over the course of training. So, so the relevant thing about developmental interpretability is suppose it's, it's possible to understand what's going on inside of neural networks, largely understand them. Well, first assumption. <laughs> first assumption. Well, then it's, it's still going to be very difficult 
to do that at one specific moment in time. I think intractable. And I think the only way you're actually going to build up an exhaustive idea of what structure the model has internally is to look at how it forms over the course of training. You want to look at each moment which it learns specific concepts and skills and isolate those because that tells you where to look, where to look for structure. And so developmental interpretability is this idea that you should study how structure forms in neural networks. That that actually might be much more tractable than trying to understand how structure is at the end of training. Right, so it's the overall process of seeing those like small phase transitions and seeing those like small bones appear in a body or something. And at the end, you when you have the full body, you're like, oh, I know, I know how it forms. I know where, where it's like created like a new bone or a new a new structure. This is an excellent analogy because the the developmental biology is a place we should look for for input, right? They actually have experience studying systems, very large systems, that grow in similar ways. So you look at like cell differentiation, and that involves phase transitions that you can study. Um, I think I think the um, like the devil's advocate point of view, I would say that like you know babies they 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 come with like a big a big brain. That's why the wombs of of of, of women are so are, are so large, and this is because we we already have everything that needs that is required for a human to be general in this kind of brain, right? And so maybe the development is is more like something about evolution than something about like our brain. Because our brain like starts somehow general. Yeah, but I mean, did a stork drop that baby off? <laughs> that woman's uterus? No, I mean, um, at some point, everybody's a single cell, right? It's a single fertilized cell. And then many cell divisions later, you end up with a baby. So if you understand those divisions, maybe it's a more tractable way to understand what you end up with. So for biology, do you think there's anything that is like a uh, reasonable amount of time humanity could take to like understand how we go from cells to like a body, like all the single, the single processes that like like in the genome that like creates humans as they are. Like if you think it's possible with AI, do you think it's possible with humans or maybe humans are more complicated? Um, I think in the case of humans, I think it's possible in principle. Um, I think the difficulty there is more in, in terms of measurement, right? And so this is the same thing with the difference between neuroscience and AI. With AI, we have the weights on our computers and we can follow the entire development of these systems. I don't, I don't really have the GPT-4 weights on my computer. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> Someone does. <laughs> right? And, and so this, uh, it might still run into limits of, of tractability. It might not be, it might be very expensive to run all that compute, but you don't have to run through these, these hoops of figuring out even how to measure the thing, which is the central problem in, in biology. I'm saying this as somebody who does not know. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm kind of like curious what does like a perfect world look like in your, in your view? Like imagine we, we get like all these like phase transitions and we get like all these structures that emerge and we, and we see them and we have this like huge model, let's say GPT-5, um, and we can like identify maybe like hundreds, hundreds of those. Um, what happens next? Then we, we can tell what the thing has learned and we can like point, like, could we just like see like GPT-5 generating like a huge paragraph or like a, a huge piece of text and be like, oh, now we know that like, there's those structures that explain like how deep and how precise can we go with this approach? Like, is this like scalable? Like as you tell me the term or? Let me give you two answers. So first is sort of the prosaic, boring answer. And that's something like, well, if you can understand when the dangerous capabilities form, you can understand when misaligned values form, you can prevent them if you understand this process sufficiently and you can steer it in the right directions. And so developmental interpretability, this becomes um, something that supports many other kinds of alignment techniques. That's the boring answer. The more speculative answer is, suppose this really works and you get this deep understanding of the relation between structure and function. Now then you can do something like eliciting latent knowledge, ELK. You can try to extract this knowledge, these skills from the network and implement it in another system where you understand everything that is going on. And so you distill 
you you use that to create verifiably safe systems so you try to extract the knowledge from the dangerous model that is maybe bigger and you distill and then you have like a you can build like a safer model from 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 this yeah and i don't think this is easy is easy right i think this is a problem on the order of the manhattan project probably harder um but i don't think there's anything in principle making that impossible and so i in your in your first answer this is like the boring answer um you, you can just like see where did like deceptive behavior emerge right and and so maybe there's two like counterpoints one is like okay you see the kind of like deceptive behavior but like yep. there's like nothing you can do about it uh because it's, it's already here and the second thing is maybe maybe if i try to like channel my inner Yudkowsky, uh i would say something like all the all the like cognitive behaviors like necessary to like play um <laughs> not play chess but solve like very complicated math require me to be like good at like deception and so there's no way of separating any of those behaviors and it's like it's like either you have like yeah. very dangerous stuff or you're like pretty like narrow and so I, I think this really gets to the point that um it's also unclear where you draw the divide between capabilities and values right both of these things are implemented in these models and so to the extent that structures like like skills, abilities emerge through phase transitions, we should expect something similar for values or what these, these systems actually want. And so I don't, think, I don't think you end up with a system of fully interpreting these systems and fully interpreting their capabilities without being able to interpret their values and what they want. And so you will be able to like see that like this AI doesn't value humans or value paper clips or... I mean, again, this is... This is far from where we are right now, but it is the speculative picture. So wh where are we right now? <laughs> we are able to <laughs> do the theory on the toy models of superposition, and we have lots of projects going. So the, the, the toy model of superposition is like something you guys have worked on, or the, 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 is it the thing you, you were talking about from Neil Nanda? What, uh, well, what is this? So yeah, t the toy models of superposition is this model, very simple, you know, you you have some vector, just synthetic data, not interesting. Well, <laughs> synthetic data, and you try to compress it, and then you try to expand it back to the original. Because there's this bottleneck, it's actually a difficult learning task. It's like an autoencoder, right? It's like an autoencoder, exactly. Now, I mentioned this because it's the model that's currently best understood from the theory, from singular learning theory's point of view. And I still don't understand what singular learning theory <laughs> So singular learning theory um, is a theory of, say, hierarchical models. Hierarchical models like neural networks, like hidden Markov models, like certain other kinds of models. And these, these models, these hierarchical models, are very special because it's the case that the mapping from parameters to functions is not one-to-one. -one. So you can have different models. If you look at the weights, they seem like very different models, but they're actually implementing the same function. So that's actually a very special feature of these of these systems and it leads to all kinds of special properties when you say systems is like not neural networks this is this is more general than just learning uh than neural networks it's like any um learning algorithm or right so any singular learning algorithm and that's consists of these hierarchical model classes <laughs> yeah i feel like if you say like hierarchical model classes this is like so general that i don't really see a concrete example it, it is very general um, but that doesn't that doesn't lower the the strength of the and results. Is is a neural network part of those uh, singular learning models? Yeah, neural networks are singular, and that's why they work. Cool. So so your theory applies to neural networks. That so that's good. Um, if if someone is like hearing you say stuff about like hierarchical classes and and someone is like completely lost and has no idea what you're talking about, <laughs> just like. Um, any like explanation of like the properties of those of those things that like make it like interesting? Like, w w why do we why is something singular and not singular? What is like example of something like not singular? So it's this this the fact that you could have two different systems and you look at the the weights. So you look at the strengths of the connections between neurons and they seem totally different, but actually right. th they have the same input output behavior. They're implementing the same function. So as long as you have a a set of parameters that that can map, be mapped to a function. And that you have like two different set of parameters that like map to the same function. You can, you say the the the, the overall thing is singular. 
Yeah, there, there's some more technical conditions. There are actually like two things, but in any case, this this is the important one to just keep in mind um, on that. So yeah, I'm curious more about like your your story about um, alignment or when did you like when Jesse Oakland started being like concerned about AI posing like an existential threat? Um, was it like at 16, at 12, or at 20? Like what was the moment where you said like, oh damn, I need to like spend my entire life on this? It's a good question. So I have always been interested in neural networks, right? These are just fascinating things and interesting systems to study. Uh, and I remember reading in 2015, Super Intelligence by Nick Bostrom about- a, a very good book. It's a good book still. Um, but at the time I thought, you know, oh, AGI, that's far in the future. It's not here yet. And so really, I think it's, I think it's when I started using Copilot more regularly that I realized, oh shit. Like 2021, 2022? Uh, yeah, exactly. That's when I realized, oh, actually, it's happening soon. Um, and then all of the other concerns, you know, came to the foreground. And this curiosity suddenly weaponized into concern. What exactly in using, like, Copilot made you think that, like, AI was going fast? Was it just, like, you were using it for work, for your studies, and you were like, oh, it's doing most of my work? Or is it just, like, you didn't know how to code very well, and, like, it was able to, like, help you code and be more, more, much more productive? I mean, there's still this meme that goes around about stochastic parrots, right? That AIs are really just repeating what they've seen in the data and it's all non, like it's, they don't actually understand what's going on. They're just repeating. Um, and I really started to see engaging with these systems, 2020, 2021, that there was more going on. They were actually solving original problems. Um, they're actually reasoning. There's, you know, there's, there's, there's something there. And at that point I realized, okay, you, uh, you know, we're in the end game now. Yeah. Where is the reasoning? Like, if I'm like Gary Marcus or uh, Tim Scar from ML Street Talk, I would say like, where is the reasoning? I don't see the reasoning. Well, you, you pose original questions that you know that are not in the data set. Like what? It's you know niche programming problems that have never showed up before because you are doing something something weird and uh, and new. Like, it doesn't it doesn't take long to end up in a weird corner of of a uh, creativity space that has never been explored before. But he's it, it, just doing like copy pasting from Stack Overflow and he's just like really mixing up those uh, those concepts. He doesn't really understand what's going on. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, so, so I think here, um, the word creativity, right? Like look at the word creativity and says something about creation. And I think that's actually just a terrible word for the phenomenon. Most of the time, creativity is about synthesis. It is about combining things together. Right, so people people have this weird myth in their heads about creativity needing about needing to be about creating new original content when really most of the work we're doing is just combining things together. And and so you saw Copilot and you were like, oh, this shit is creative. Um, this is going faster than I thought. So what did you do next to before you came here? What was the thing that we were were you interested in? Like, how, what was the path that led you to like, um, you know, have those thoughts about interpretability or or, or how to solve alignment? So I, so I always thought um, there's a lot of tooling from physics to pull into studying neural networks. Uh, and that's taken a long time for, I think, other people to realize. There, are, there are, you know, A lot of physicists have tried to make their mark on, on machine learning. It's just a thing, thing physicists do is they got into the world and they see, oh, here's a new field. I'm going to try to make my mark in this field and uh, impose my arrogant physics ideas on this, on this subfield. Um, and yeah, there was still a lot of room to do that. And so I, I saw at some point, I stumbled across singular learning theory and I saw, oh, this is the natural place where physics comes to, comes into the picture to say something useful about, about AI and alignment. And w when you saw this like specific paths from singular learning theory, um, was it like strategy? You said, like, was it, what was the roadmap? What was the thing that need to happen for, for, for us to be alive in the say 50 years? We need to get a Manhattan Project going, I think. We need to involve all of the major scientists in the world. I want Terence Tao working on this problem. I want uh, Konsevich working on this problem. I want the, the biggest physicists um, to all be thinking about this. I want every smart technical person on the planet leaving college to think about AI safety for a few years. How, how do we get those people like realistically to spend some time on the problem? You hit the subscribe button. <laughs> <laughs> 
and you and you support me on Patreon. Uh. <laughs> and hit the bell. Uh. So, um, if you're a famous physicist and you're not subscribed, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's gonna take it's gonna take a while. I mean, we're not. Yeah, we've got a lot of work cut out for ourselves. Um, but it's gonna look something like um, create lots of lots of positions, research orgs, uh, academic positions. Find ways to involve academia and a bunch of researchers from many different disciplines who have not been involved yet. And so developmental interpretability is a place where this happens. It's a place where you can pull in developmental biologists. It's a place you can pull in uh, string theorists and, and statistical physicists. It's a place you can pull in algebraic geometers and a bunch of other mathematicians. Um, there are other areas like this where we want to involve many different people, not just from academia, but also from, from industry and other places. So. You know, it's about building those bridges and, and doing the outreach. So I agree that we need to like bring more scientists to solve alignment. And I would be like very excited to have like biologists or physicists working together in this. Um, and we can like build bridges by like pointing out like some work they can do, some like academic or papers that they can just like focus on. What should I look for on the internet to like learn more about this topic? So if you want to learn more about this technical subject of singular learning theory, developmental interpretability, you should go to singularlearningtheory.com. Uh, another place you can go is metauni.org. They have a bunch of amazing seminars hosted in Roblox, of all places. Metauni.com? Metauni.org, I believe. And so they, they host these online seminars, an online university inside of Roblox. I can confirm we are on the correct timeline. <laughs> Uh, in any case, uh, those are places you can find out more about these subjects if you're interested in technical work on these subjects. Yeah, I heard there's also like some uh, popular Les Wrong post you wrote on, on singular learning theory, right? So you can also like read this kind of blog post you wrote on Les Wrong. Yeah, look up um, neural networks generalized because of this one weird trick. Oh, so you were the one who like wrote this like clickbait article. Well, I mean, <laughs> I know how it is for you. Clickbait is real. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you just you just owe me, uh, Mr. Clark Kent. Uh, you you like Roblox, it seems, uh, but it seems like you're the real version of a Roblox character, a mix between Captain America <laughs> and Jack. Oh, sorry, Clark Kent and a Roblox character. So, why are we so ripped? What what's the purpose of all of this? <laughs> <laughs> If you want to join the forces and join the army, uh, this is the 4th of July. So um, I think we're just going to like stop here and um, maybe shoot some guns. If you want to join the forces, maybe maybe we should follow him. <laughs> I will cut it. I will cut it. I will cut it. You started it. You started it. Oh no, this this could be really good. Yeah, this could be yeah, really yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you you you